whatever you do, don't fall asleep. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. I'm gonna die out of here. It's the 1980s with the Literary License Podcast retrospective of 80s horror films with your co-hosts Joe Radazzo, Vicky Ray, John Wilson, and Keith Shago, keeping everything tubular and rad. You're not even gonna swat that fly. I hope they are watching. They'll see. They'll see and they'll know. They'll say. She wouldn't even have a fly. I'm your number one fan. Hello, welcome to Literary Lessons Podcast since the 80s, where we'll be discussing films from the 80s. And following on from our Horror is Art Month, we'll be covering The Hunger from 1983 and Liquid Sky from 1982. And before we get started, let's find out who's with us. We got Joe Randazzo with us. Hello, Joe. Hey, everyone. Great to see you guys again. And Vicky Ray. Hello, Vicky. Hi, guys. Happy Easter. Uh, <laughs> oh, that, yeah, that's happy right. Easter, this weekend. Everyone. And Passover's this weekend, too. Yep. yep. And Ramadan. We got them all. Yeah. Oh, they're all this every weekend. Re- okay. Every religion hit, <laughs> except for the Buddhists. Except for the Sorry, Catholics. Boobs. They're always right. <laughs> Sorry, dudes. And it's about it's that time of year in America where we have let's pass over when we pass <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> Our people will be free. <laughs> oh. Shut up. I know I had a lot of good jokes, and I'm afraid that I mean there's some shit I just know I couldn't post. I was dying though. It's Trigger zombie fingers. weekend where we where we host the original zombie Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, before we get started and go down this rabbit hole, let's find out what we've been up to. And let's start off with you, Joe. What have you been up to lately? Um, well, uh, this last week, I, I took on a second uh, second gig, just proctoring exams uh, at a a local high school. Actually, it's the, the high school from all the, uh, the John Hughes movies. You poor man. So I've been busy doing that and working at a. Uh, Still, still working as a bartender and uh, and a server, so I've been kind of uh, double duty, and I've been I'm still dealing with the sinus infection that I had uh, during last week's show, so that's been on and off. Like it's been fine for like a day or two, then it's kicking my ass for like two days, and it's gone for two days. So uh, I don't know what to think. Poor guy. I'll be okay. You're a real. We love him for soldiering on. That's for sure. What about yourself, Vix? What have you been up to? Not a whole lot. Um, like I said, getting ready to for my early Mother's Day present next weekend. But um, yeah, I've been, and I'm really all excited. I finally lost 20 pounds. It took me five months, but yes, I did. And now none of my clothes fit, which is a good problem. But I actually, uh, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Got to keep going. I don't do that that borderline diabetes thing when someone says you're borderline it's like uh uh-uh time to change something different gotta go but um i watched what did i watch um oh you know how i really skittish of you know 2021 movies and stuff and i Mm -hmm. can't find my notes but i watched this movie with megan um fox did she get work done on her face oh i don't looks like it did you know what i i watched this movie called till death yesterday or was the day before i had insomnia like 1 30 morning 
And it was about, it was, you have, I can't even explain it, but there wasn't a lot of people in there, but you know, it's just, her husband is a hateful asshole and he's going to kill himself anyway. So he chains her to oh, him. I've, oh yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. And then yeah. she's got to drag his sorry ass all over the place. And it's just, it's just an anxiety attack because I can't imagine being chained to my dead ex-husband. That would just be, that'd be beyond traumatic. And I watched this movie last night. I didn't think I was going to like it, but it was called Raze, R-A-Z-E. It was on, I think it, I believe it was Netflix, might have been Amazon Prime, but it was about these women that are all captured and they they have to kickbox to the death. I mean, this is like massive, brutal stuff. And I mean, it was it's not for the squeamish, but um, it's actually it was a good little sleeper movie. It was another, I believe, might have been earlier than 2020. I don't know, but it's really worth watching if you got nothing better to do. But uh, there's some really good stuff that's up and that we're I've been looking at that I just haven't been wanting to do because I thought because 2020, 2021. It's going to suck, but a lot of them do, but some of them are actually pretty good. But I'm um, just doing my garden and all that other good shit. What are y'all up to? Um, I've been watching Raised by Wolves, the Ridley Scott TV series. It's I was going to, I didn't start that yet. I keep looking at it and I didn't start it yet. It's quite good, actually. Is it? I, got, I went through the first season. I guess the second season started now, so... Um, but yeah, oh. I'm quite enjoying it. Um, it's doing its way before I forget what's coming. Well, they're, oh, things. Um, oh God, they're coming out with their fourth, fifth season, fourth season. What? Stranger, oh, Stranger Things. things? Yeah. Stranger Things. Why am I having a coffee moment? Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait to see what happens to everybody. Cool. And I think, um, is this the final season or going to, uh, or, is, or is it not? I don't know. It's season four, so it is now. It is season so. four. Um, and what else have I been watching? Um, Ultimatum on Netflix, which is really good. From the makers of Love is Blind. Where they take couples and basically they... Basically, they give their partner an ultimatum. They either marry me or it's over. Is so it a reality they show? They take, yeah, they take about these ten couples, eight couples. I don't know, eight or ten couples. Right. And then basically what they do is they um, pair off with someone else and live together as husband and wife for three weeks. Sounds like wife swap. Well, it's it's quite, it's quite interesting, actually. I'm really, I'm really enjoying it, actually. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I'm at the prickly end of it now where they're, <laughs> and then they get back together and then they live with each other. Then they right. go back to live with each other and, you know, some of them are falling in love with the other person and stuff. So it's it's good. I mean, it's kind of like a little science experimental sort of thing. But, yeah, I'm quite enjoying that. Um, and then, yeah, just the normal nine to five sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. how's things going over there in the across the pond? Mm, it's fine. I mean, everyone's a lot poorer. So, what can, you know, <laughs> what we are. But we're a lot yeah. poorer over here, too. Definitely yeah. trimming the fat on the bills. That's for sure. Well, all our, all our taxes have gone up, so and the electricity and there's a cost of living crisis out going on here. And it's not any better price, over here, love. Um, food has tripled in the last month. Transportate tube. My tube journey has gone from two pounds fifty a day to eight pounds a day. It's just a, it's like a it's like a what do you call it a domino effect. Boom, boom, boom. Well, and they keep blaming the fuel on the tube, and the tube's run by electricity. Figure that one out. So I yeah. Don't know. Everyone, well, they got to have coal and stuff to generate the electricity and diesel. People got to realize that. We're so. we're, ne- we're on nuclear energy. Oh, you are? Uh, They're yeah. trying to close but, down our nuclear around these areas. It's like, man, they can't take everything. God. Uh, we're building more of them. So we'll Well, that's that smart. Goes. It's clean energy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Until you have an earthquake. Until the China <laughs> syndrome happens. And then you'll yeah. all be with your garden hoses trying to get the big meltdown. <laughs> and, we're, and we don't and we don't do very well with terrorists over here. We always seem to have them here, so we'll wait until that one goes. How that pans out? But. Oh, you had a terrorist attack? Mm, well, we haven't had one for a year. They're usually so hitting we, you too. We normally get we normally got we normally got three to eight a year. Yeah, you know, I know it is. You know, I mean, God, they're still trying to get over Ariana Grande concert where they killed all those teenage girls. So, oh, still Manchester. Well, yeah, I mean, you know. 
That's now awful, fa- though. Now that the family of the terrorists is suing the UK government, and it's just like, oh. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how the bad people have more rights than the good people all of a sudden? So. Yeah, well, this is the world we made. So That's proud. what Rick Brown's but, Yeah, are besides for. that, though. <laughs> Open so before we get into our podcast, what we're going to do is we're going to cut to an ad from Fiery Kitten Cot Podcast. So take it away, Fiery Kitten Podcast. Are you itching for a good story? Laughter among friends, maybe even a mystery or two? Well, you're in luck. Fire Breathing Kittens is a standalone Dungeons and Dragons podcast. Each episode is a separate three hour long story, like a movie for your ears, so you can listen to these adventures in any order you like. So join us on a real play DD quest as we solve mysteries, attempt comedic banter, and enjoy friendship. Fire Breathing Kittens podcast fantasy action mystery friendship. Hello, welcome back to Literary Relations Podcast, and we're discussing The Hunger from 1983, which is a supernatural horror film directed by Tony Scott, starring Catherine Deneuve, David Bowie, and Susan Sarandon. An international production of the United, Ki- United St- Kingdom in the United States. Um, the film is a loose adaptation of the 1981 novel of the same name by Whitley Stryber, with a screenplay by Ivan Davis and Michael Thomas. His plot concerns a love triangle between a doctor who specializes in sleep and aging research, played by Susan Sarandon, and a vampire couple, played by Catherine Deneuve and David Bowie. The film's special effects were handled by makeup artist Dick Smith. After premiering at the 1983 Cannes Film Festival, The Hunger was released in the spring of 1983 by MGM. Though it received a mixed critical response at this time, the film has now acquired a cult following within the goth subculture in the years since its release. So we're going to do a cut to the trailer of The Hunger and be right back. Sarah Roberts is in jeopardy. Hey, lady. How about it? Stay with her. Help her, for she has begun to feel the awful horror of The Hunger. John Blaylock. The Hunger has given him everlasting life. Until now, pray for him. Miriam Blaylock. She feeds one day in seven on the unsuspecting, and soon she will turn into something that you will never be able to forget. No matter how hard and how long you try, fear her. What have you done to me? Forever and ever. And life signs terminate right here. The timeless beauty of Catherine Deneuve, the cruel elegance of David Bowie, the open sensuality of Susan Sarandon, combined to create a modern classic of perverse fear. Haunting, mysterious, sensual, strange, perverse, riveting. The Hunger. Hello, welcome back to Literary Relations Podcast, and we're discussing The Hunger from 1983. And starting with you, Joe, what are your thoughts on The Hunger? You know, it's it's strange because I this was the first time I'd ever seen the movie. I uh I had heard so many mixed things about it. Like you said, the reviews were mixed and I never really had any interest in seeing it, but man, seeing it, uh, I just watched it this morning. I rented it on, uh, on iTunes and I just, (coughs) I just, uh, uh, watched it. And wow. Um, I've been missing out. Apparently I really, really enjoyed this movie. Um, it's, it's strange because it's, you you can kind of see a little bit where where Tony Scott uh, came from. Like this is his first um, uh, his first feature film, uh, apparently. But by, by looking them up, it's the first one I saw. Um, yeah, it uh, and yeah, it's 
<clears throat> it, he hit the ground running with this, which is mm. really, really cool because the movie starts out just really cool, real something that, you know, in 1983, we're, we're not doing that much, which is the, the this weird cutting between uh, Bauhaus's uh, Bela Lugosi is dead. And um, it's just a really strange movie. I mean, now uh, probably for its time. Now uh, a lot of this stuff is um, a lot more a, mo- a lot more prevalent. I feel, um, but I really liked it. I liked the storytelling. I, I I it kept me guessing. Like I was trying to figure out what was going on, which is really good for for uh, for this kind of movie because I was trying to figure out what the relationship was between uh, between David Bowie and Catherine uh, Denier, why he was aging so rapidly, if he's a vampire and eventually as it as it all just kind of unravels it's it really it really works i really really mm-hmm. enjoy it um this is uh this is one that now that i have seen it i'm going to probably go back and rewatch it and see if the little theories that i have about it are right well i mean what's quite interesting about it is that basically it's about eternal youth now she offers them eternal life it's the youth part that's the problem isn't it because yeah. all those all those people when she when they get old they're they still get old. living like David Bowie is basically still living in that box. Yeah, so are all of her <laughs> other lovers that she taken yeah. from Sanction Egypt. Yeah. And that is and that so, is dark. It's very dark. And I mean she's yeah. you could just tell she she really I mean as far as uh, uh the the vampire genre, she puts a lot of class and style to it even though she's crawling around on all fours eventually lapping up blood and <laughs> I mean, because Catherine Deneuve, I mean, you don't even really think of her as, I don't know, she's just Catherine, you know, you you don't expect to see her. I said, I mean, has she ever done another raw film like this? I'm trying to think back. I haven't seen this one in decades. This is the first time I've revisited this probably in like three decades, actually. I mean, I can't think of another thing I saw. The first thing I saw her in was Roman Polanski's Repulsion. Which one, hon? Repulsion. um, Roman Polanski's Repulsion. You know, she's going mad in the house and all the hands are coming out of the walls. And That one's actually a good one to go revisit, too. <laughs> I haven't yeah. seen that in a long time as well. But I mean, it's very is, dark. It's very dark. But I, I think what I quite like about this, and this is why I kind of, kind of you know, when we talk to the next film um, after this. Right. But I like the idea that it's a gothic movie. It's just a gothic movie set in, in a modern time. I mean, everything yes. about it is gothic. From it the way is. that she's the way that they're dressed, to the you know the architecture, and even the club is very gothy, very gothic. Yeah, I mean, well, think back to the eighties, though. I mean, in the big cities, and then like no matter whether you were in London, New York, or whatever. I mean, those underground clubs, and I mean, really, the the whole the whole thing, which I I started reading into this last night after I watched both movies, and I totally forgot about the midnight movies. And I think that the IFC building is built where the Midnight Movie Theater used to be. I think that's where IFC is now. But that's yeah, where the IFC should... Theater on West Fourth Street. Yeah, yeah, that's where. Yeah, okay, same place. And the old that's where the theater. Yeah, and and that's where all the Midnight movies used to come out. I mean, there's just a proverbial cornucopia of of Midnight movies that I didn't realize were out there. When you go in and start looking the in the behind, you know, the background of these. I found all these other movies. I mean, you could go on for years <laughs> talking about all these movies. It's just just so many of them. And they're all like this. And I, I don't know if this is the first one that explores the bi- bisexual vampirism thing between two women. I kind of think in the 60s, they kind of hinted that way, maybe with some of the Hammer films. Well, we had, but, some, uh, we had some Hammer Horror did it. lesbian films. Did they in the Hammer Yeah, Horror? Blood and Roses did it too. So they're, 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 it's been done. Right. But this probably was probably not probably not as sensual and as sexy as this though. Yeah, this was that. pretty, and probably not in as mainstream a film as this. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, Susan Sarandon wasn't a big star yet. I no. mean, Catherine Deneuve was. David Bowie used to do his little independent art films, like What Do You Do, The Man Who Fell to Earth, and Mary Kristen Smith for Lawrence is the only two films he did before this. Yeah, the Labyrinth didn't come out till what, 80... 88, 89, yeah. somewhere on there. <laughs> so, but, um, and Susan Sarandon was just, I mean, this is an interesting tidbit I found is that Susan Sarandon was in Rocky Horror Picture Show 
Right. And her husband boyfriend in this film was in the sequel Shock Treatment as Brad Majors. Cliff was Young. he? <laughs> yeah, he was in Shock Treatment. I didn't know that. Yeah, we covered Shock Treatment in um, December, didn't we? Yeah, so. I'm just trying to think of who he is. He's um, Brad Majors. He was the boyfriend, uh, the the one in this movie. With. Yeah, in this movie. Okay, okay, yeah, I understand now. I mean, yeah, in the sequel, he played the part that was played by uh, what's his name in the original? Uh, Barry Bostwick. Barry Bostwick. Yeah, I don't know why his name was escaping me. Sorry about that. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's who he was in Shock Treatment. Yeah. Well, do you guys uh, agree with that? It was a cinematic work of art that stood the test of time. Uh, this so movie, I I think so. Yeah. It works at its own pace. It has its own vampire legends. Obviously, they can go out in the sunlight and enjoy the day, sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's why I was kind of wondering if she, I wonder if she is. I mean, I know that they never use the word vampire, and I'm kind no. of wondering if maybe um, it's the critics who are using the word vampire because may, I sometimes something made me think that maybe she wasn't a vampire. Maybe she's like an well. That's the general consensus. I have not read the book. But I'm assuming she's a vampire. Yeah, there's blood. Yeah. There's death. And I mean, these guys are yeah, but they, but she, Yeah, but she doesn't have to. They don't, she doesn't have to live on blood. Blood's used to keep them young. That's the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, they about do. Do they? Young, I didn't see them eat. Did you see them eat? No, it's just it's the, they went after the youth. It's the, basically like you know the female Lady Dracula in Transylvania, where she like Elizabeth Bathory kind blood. of stuff. Yeah, that's it. So that I yeah. guess being the head vampire, she doesn't uh, she doesn't age like they do. Well, yeah. she's like her one lover, of the first. Her age. Yeah, base. Yeah, I guess like you know she's zero, planet, uh, patient zero, isn't she? I guess, but um, but yeah, I guess it doesn't last. She promises them. She does promise them eternal life. She just, I think they just expect eternal. Yeah, well, they got eternal, eternal life. She, it's just yeah, not. they do get that. She does deliver <laughs> on that. <laughs> they, but they're stuck yeah. in a freaking box for. The rest of millennia, but I didn't. You know what? It took said, somebody. I think Joe mentioned it after the fact, but I did catch William Defoe and John Pankow. I did. They were the guys standing by the phone. I think. Yeah. Was that yeah. like their they first were. deal? Because I go, that's that's Defoe, and I didn't. I didn't know he was in this. I didn't know that's where he was. I mean, it kind of freaked me out. Like, yeah. oh my god, that's Defoe. I don't know if it was their first, but it was definitely before they were well known. Because I mean. Otherwise, well, uh, next, they would they would have been more prominent. Speak, his first speaking role would be Streets of Fire, which would come out a year later. Right, right. He was yeah. actually quite good in that. He's really yeah. quite good in anything. <laughs> and they were both together in um, uh, To Live and Die in L.A. Yeah. Yeah. We had, I haven't seen that in a long time either. Like two, I was going to say, this, this. Season, this season, we've covered quite a, bit, a lot of films with William Dafoe in them, actually. Um, you know, not on purpose, but he, te- he seems to be popping in in a lot of our Yeah, films. he has Doesn't popped he? up. Like, oh, it's like, oh, it's like whack a mole. Yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. oh, Defoe. Yeah, it's like he's popping what, up. What do you guys so, think of the soundtrack? I, I, I like, it. yeah, I, I love the whole operatic classical music. Um, he was I a remember, cellist. David Bowie was in this, right? He was, and that's where she found him, like in France, because he kept going back and forth to thinking the minuets, and obviously he was in some European seventeen hundred yeah, so, setup. Yeah, and I mean, um, I remember the soundtrack. The soundtrack's available on the uh, classical mo- uh, classical label. It's was got it? a Barry, beautiful soundtrack, actually. Very Sabato. So. Um, yes. Um, so that's that's where the soundtrack's available on. I remember when this um came out on video as well that we used to have midnight parties at the record store I was working at in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we'd watch The Hunger was one of our midnight movies that we'd all gather around it in the record store and watch it on the video when we the first started renting videos. So You know, thinking back, I mean um I guess Joe was he's younger than us, but do you remember when we were at the at, go to theaters and watch this? Do you remember how people reacted? Because this was all pretty raw stuff that was coming, you know, up. Well, through I didn't the ranks, see so this. Speak. I didn't see this at the movie theaters. Um, I um, but I you know, but it was a 
I would, I mean, I was a goth hanging around with other goths, so this is like our go to movie, so sort of right. Thing. It was, you know, it'd be this, a double feature with this, and then I think Desperately Seeking Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, but I mean, we were really into it, but we, I mean, I was a Baja fan anyway, so we got to see Baja. And, right. And, you know, and it's got, it's all very gothic and dark and, and, you know, it's got a good script and it's very understated as well. It's everything just, it's very artistic. You know, well, it's artistic, but the sexuality in it was, I mean, there, some people thought it was depravity, of course. People were freaking out back then. I mean, you know, lesbian love, vampire lesbian love, kind of stuff like that. That was, that, that I, I never really watched how geared, how people reacted towards this stuff because a lot of it was pretty shocking for the eighties. And then after a while you got desensitized like us, you know, and like anything was game. Well, I, I don't think I ever was shocked by the lesbianism in it because it was so beautifully done. I mean, it's, you know, you're not really seeing anything, but it, you know, you're seeing something, especially the blood, the blood transfer and the yeah, rest but it's all done. On. It's all done behind like billowing, like, transparent the fluffy panel. curtains C- curtains and you know the wind blowing and it's like all shadows and, you know <laughs> it was dark too not only was the genre the film dark but i mean it was dark even when you were outside it was dark you know and it yeah. took on that kind of hue i don't know what they would call it you guys are better on that stuff than me well another I was- thing i found uh, to be honest what i found a bit more shocking this time around is the teenage girl I mean, the mouth on her, it's just like my mom collects, you know, my mom collects pills. It's like, oh, okay. What was that? I didn't understand. I didn't hear you completely. The, uh, the feet, the little, the girl in it. The, the girl like, that was coming over to play music, yeah. music with them. I mean, she was quite mature for her age. Well, she was grooming her to be her next companion. Because she, I guess she knew, I guess that, I, I guess those were all men in the the caskets. I, I didn't hear any women. Of, no, there's there some women in there. Women. There's some women corpses. Oh, there was. There. there was like one other I saw with the long hair. I couldn't tell the rest. But apparently yeah. she doesn't care. She just wants a companion. I mean, she's really cold. She knows what's going to happen to these people. She offers them eternal life, but she doesn't give them the, the little caveat that comes with it. Well, I thought it was cool that she doesn't actually kill them when they get to that stage. It's like, why don't you just kill them? Put them out well, of misery. Well, I think she can't. Doesn't she say so? Where was that? I had it written down. She says well, she something. Said she, she says she can't. Be, I think, though, I don't think it's... um, She can't because she can't physically do it. I think emotionally she can't. Well, she still loves them. Do you think she actually loves these people? I think there is a... I think there's a love and a fondness there. She, she I mean, she's very... I mean, the thing is, there's a connection there between her and David Bowie. And then, right. even, and then when David Bowie starts aging rapidly, um, which I have to say, I love the way that they mixed it with the science. Yeah. The, the disease that they're talking about is a real disease. That's real, yes, it is. Disease, it is. And, um, but, you know, she doesn't give up on them. She just, you know, she just doesn't know what to do. You know what I mean? So she's just helpless. So it's not like she's up, you know, upset with them or anything like that, or she doesn't want it. She just, she's just helpless. Yeah, but she does toss them like an old shoe into the trunk. But that's I, where I you get the- Susan Sarandon comes in because she's the gerontologist. Is that how you say it? Yeah. What were you saying, Joe? I, I, uh, what, what I was going to say is I was watching it with my roommate, and I, and I kind of thought like you did, that, that it was kind of cold the way she's treating all her old lovers. And then my and I'm like, does she really love them? And my roommate kind of turned around. And he's like, well, her relationship with uh, with David Bowie at this point, I think she said they've been together like 200 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, if you're with someone for a long amount of time, you're going to develop some kind of affection for them. You know, right. especially mm-hmm. in this case, 200 years. That's, you know, double like more than double our lifespan so right. yeah you're gonna you're gonna grow attached i think you're gonna have some kind of yeah, she, uh, she, emotional she's attachment picking, and, and she's picking the person that she wants to be who she wants to spend her 200 years with 
Do you think she yeah. picked Susan Sarandon because he tried to, um, David Bowie tried to acquaint himself with her for some kind of cure and then she notices her? Or did she see her in the beginning of the movie? I, keep I think that um, she was, well, she was watching the documentary. With That's Susan right. I, she saw her somewhere. Okay. Yeah, but, she, she, uh, maybe it's just she knows her work and she knows that she's working on some on, so, on something to do with aging and maybe she figures this is the right person that can help us with this problem. Right. And it, it might be someone that basically that might not age like the other ones are because she'll be fine. She'll, she'll have better, she's better equipped to sit there and stop the process happening to her so it might be a longer companion for her. But well, Susan she doesn't seem also to age has, though. Like, well, well she, you know, she... But she she's like, like the first vampire or something from Egypt. Yeah, she's like, yeah, like Queen of the Dam. They're like Queen of the Dam. She's not going to die either. And she's going to wipe out, you know, a lot of people through yeah. the years. And I mean, but the thing is, is um, Susan Randon basically was attracted to her anyway. There is, there isn't, I mean, when she opens the door and she meets her, uh, meets Captain Demet for the very first time. Right. You know, this, this is Balzac or Bullets or whatever it is. But, um, you know, there there is a spark that goes on between them. Yeah, there's an attraction. I thought it was funny I mean, though. After that happened, and she went to go eat with her boyfriend, she wasn't hungry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just like, there was something weird. I mean, a little tense about that. I was trying to figure out they 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 had a clinical relationship though. Like, well, it looks like that they were. You know, I think what you have is. Someone who's married to their work and having a relationship when you're married to your work is more of a convenience than it is of a a love situation. You right. know what I mean? They work together, so it's just easy. You know, it's just easy to have a relationship if you're married to your job to be find somebody to have a sexual relationship with by who you're working with because it's easier. Right. Because you, know, you can spend all your time in the lab and then you can just go home and go to sleep. And if you need a little bit of sex, you have a little bit of sex and you don't go back to work today. Right. Today, you know what I mean? Right. So, she has, she had a lot of restraint. They had both had a lot of restraint for the young girl that kept coming over. Was she, a, she was playing the violin, wasn't she? The little girl was. Well, uh, this oh, piano. Is, this is, piano. Okay. I thought Catherine yeah. Nerva was playing the piano. Yeah. Catherine Nerva, she was playing the violin and um, David Bowie's playing the bass. Okay, um, okay. But I have to sit there and say that David Bowie killing her was the most messiest thing that he ever that you can do. Because first of all, it's like she can be traced to them. She said she she told her fa- her parents that she was going over to them to drop off a note because she couldn't practice or something with them. And right. Then he killed her. So it's kinda like you know He apologized before he did it. Well, yeah, but the problem the problem is, is, is the problem is is that if you're gonna if you're going to kill victims, like the first two victims that they have, you want something that doesn't associate you or connect you with that person. If you're, you're going to get caught. Right. You know, if you're going to murder someone, murder someone you don't bloody know or have any connection with. Because if it's a friend or a family member or someone that you have an acquaintance with, gonna, it's going to be traced back to you eventually. Right. Cops are going to be knocking on your door eventually asking if you see this person because, you know, you're in their phone book. Yeah, that's that was too. I was kind of surprised that he 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 he, did. he must have been desperate to, to feed though at that point because everybody knows she comes over there. They're obviously well known, kind of in the community at least where the parents trust the child to go over there because they yeah. look like a well-to-do couple. You know what could possibly go wrong? You know. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 they're giving violin lessons anyway. That's what she. That's what they're giving. They're giving her classical music lessons. That's why the girl's there. Were they low? But, well, wait. She was grooming her. That's right, too. I, I, I think so that was also part of the part of the kill. Was part was also, you know, right? Like a couple scenes before he does it, he says something about uh, have you? You know, you've chosen your next lover. So I think he. I think part of it is also kind of the jealousy that he knows this is the person that's replacing me. I didn't think of that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna take her out too because fuck you for doing this to me. You know. Yeah, I mean, that could very be. Selfish. I never thought they're of very that. selfish people, though. Right at the end of the day, because it's all about eternal youth. That's what the whole movie's about, isn't it? Keeping your eternal youth. Did the the the, the uh, Dan? I can't say his name. Hadaya, Dadea, whatever. He was the, the lieutenant cop. Yeah, Did he Hedaya. die? I'm having a fart, brain no. fart here. He didn't die. 
No, he shows up again at the end, and uh, he oh. he talks to the guy who's uh, uh, selling it. He talks to the uh, the yeah the the real estate guy. Yeah, he talks to him at the yeah. end. Okay, that I don't know why I had a brain fart on that one. Yeah, I think I'm confused because I was I was I didn't know. You know, well, it's always going to be a, a where you're. What's the word? The ending. No spoilers. Did Susan Sarandon take up her gauntlet as like the head vampiress of people? That's how I read it. That's how you read it. Because I mean, if she was yes. the lover of her, wouldn't she not? Well, did she drink her blood or did that she stick that she made um, Catherine and Herb drink her own blood? I can't remember how that worked. It was just really dark and I couldn't tell. And uh, th- that's how she she got her to the point where all those others came out of their gra- their coffins and then they pushed her out the window. But but there was no evidence anyway, because they all kind of into dust because she just had them suffering an eternal living death. Well, it I guess like it's that. the only way to kill them. Is- Yo, go ahead, Keith. Go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, they get their vengeance on Captain Neuve and it looks like the season surrender is now the the, new. the head one. She's taking over for her. That's the way me and Joe read it. Yeah. And um and she seems to have all the money as well because all 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 the her fortunes gets donated to her foundation or organization, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's what the real estate agent says at the end. Yeah. Oh, well, so she had a nice little, so she's going to live comfortably for the next 5,000 years, <laughs> possibly. If, well, yeah, I mean, we don't really know, though. I mean, she might suffer from the same fate. Well, that's daughter, what we were we trying know. to figure out. I, he read it the way I read it. She's taking over for Catherine Deneuve. But if she was supposed to be one of her lovers, and the lovers don't usually last more than 200 years. So, I mean, I was trying to figure out, you know, why Catherine Deneuve lived longer than everybody Not because she's she was- but but she's like she her blood is 100 percent pure um and okay then when, that makes and sense when she changes her blood and her her the other blood being the normal blood being mutated into her blood but she her blood's never been mutated it's just been what it always is so well so basically probably susan sarandon centuries are numbered probably it's possible unless she's um but but then again, we do. She is a scientist, so maybe she'll find a way to fight that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, they did leave it open ended for a possible revisit with something else, but that never came to any fruition. Um, she says in Sarandon said that that um, that she regretted this sequence because it made no sense in the context with the rest of the film. And she said, the thing that made the film interesting to me was this question of, would you want to live forever if you were an addict? But as the film progressed, the powers that be rewrote the ending and I decided that I wouldn't die. So what was the point? And she thought that the rules of the film were all delineating. Well, I mean, the the vampire mythos is really tested here, isn't it? I mean, they, see, they go out daylight. She has the power of foresight. Right, Catherine Deneuve. She can pre- prevent things from happening just by using her head mind. She's got mind control, and um, she can, you know, stop trucks from hitting people. And she knows something. You know, she knows something's happened just by touching something. You know, so right. You know, so I thought that was quite interesting, and I, I like that they kept the, changing up the rules and coming up with their own rules. And it wasn't your basic, you know run-of-the-mill vampire story. It wasn't a Bram Stoker stuff. deal in any sense of the word. Mm-hmm. You know, like the regular traditional vampire story like you normally have, where everybody has to, you know, stay in their casket and garlic and crucifixes and silver doesn't seem to work on the modern-day vampire, or so it would seem. Yeah. And I love the onk. The, you know, yeah, they, don't so have fang- they don't have fangs either. Oh, they okay. didn't, did they? Did, are you sure? They didn't, did yeah. they? No, because they had to use the um, onk. The onk oh, onk. I was wondering why. Okay. I've never figured that out. Well, this is the second time I've seen it. But I, I was wondering about that. I, I just figured, like, you see in the other movies, you know, like, what was the movie? Uh, the Lycan movies and the vampire movies. Uh, with Twilight. 
Yeah, not Twilight, but uh, Underworld. Underworld, Underworld. yeah. They, some Underworld. of them got the little things on their fingers, you know, to cut, you know, flesh, but they still got fangs. Mm. So I, I didn't notice that they didn't have fangs. So that's an interesting little tidbit I missed. I mean, uh, maybe she's not a vampire at all, but an Egyptian goddess. She could be. I didn't look at it that way either. But they also yeah. do have a reflection in the mirror, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they did. It just, I don't know why I kept screaming Queen of the Damned in the back of my head for some reason. I don't know why, but it just is a little companion kind of to that in a different way to me. I don't know. Yeah. I kept thinking Queen of the Damned the whole time. Well, that all, t- that all takes place in Egypt as well, doesn't it? The, the yeah. Of, the dawn of time and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I mean, I thought I looked at it that maybe she, you know, when I was watching it, like, maybe she's not a vampire at all, really. She could just be something else. I mean, because really? there's blood involved, we, we assume uh, blood in neutral youth, we think vampire. But if you think about it, they can go outside. They don't have fangs. Um, they have to cut somebody to, in order to drink their blood. They're, um, and they, they can eat food and drink booze, obviously. Yeah, and they don't have um, they don't have e- they have eternal life, but not eternal youth either. That comes with being a vampire. Yeah. Know? So, so maybe it's something totally different. Some kind of like an ancient, you know, dark god that god. I'm gonna have to is. look up that book by Whitley Stryber. Mm-hmm. It's 1981. So, is this pre Anne Rice? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, no Anne Rice is 77. 70. Yeah. Okay. So this is after. Really? I'm just, that's right. It was in the 70s. I'm just wondering if they, I don't think they borrowed anything from it. Queen of the Damned wasn't written yet. No. That's going to make me crazy. No, I'm going to have to go in there and look. Yeah, because Lestat, Lestat has to be written first, and that's an old thick book. It takes her a while to come out with books, doesn't it? So Yeah. Well, they're big, for one. They're great, but they're big, thick, juicy books. Yeah. Let's rate um, the hunger. So, out of five stars, what would you rate it? Starting with Vix. Five. I thought it was beautifully filmed. I loved the story. It was weird. It's dark. And it's just got all of that stuff that you that's lacking from a lot of today's cinema. I loved it. And what about yourself, Joe? Same here. I really, really love it. Um, I'd say about four, four and a half, somewhere along there. Um, I could see why Tony Scott became a major director watching this. Um, It's weird uh, reading that it was both a box office bomb and it didn't get great reviews. So it's kind of strange that his next film would be uh, Top Gun, which would be a major. I know, I know. (laughs) But I mean, talent wise, you could see the talent that was emerging here. I mean, he's a fantastic director. Um, I really, really enjoyed this movie a lot more than I thought I would. Did he yeah, film, gonna... did he do direct the, ne- sorry, quick segue, because you guys always know this stuff. Did he do the the next Top Gun as well, Maverick? I've not seen it. No, I've he's heard dead. It uh, no, Is he, he dead? Su- yeah, he committed suicide. Oh, gosh. I hate yeah. when I learn something new. Sometimes. Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> that, that, fa- that famous bridge that you see in a lot of, uh, a lot of movies in L.A., uh, he jumped off that bridge. Really? I didn't yeah, know about, that. Yeah, about 10 years ago. No kidding. I wonder what yeah. gets so bad. He he's Ridley Scott's brother, who the guy who Yeah, I figured Avery. that much. I didn't know he was dead though. I had no idea about any of that. Yeah. They both started out doing commercials, you know. And they actually helped train David Fincher as well. They were part of the whole team thing. Gotcha. Where um and then Tony Tony Scott went when I started doing music videos as well, and then before he did this as well, so interesting. And David Fincher, David Fincher went right from commercials to you know on music videos, and then went into films after that. Um, David Fincher did um, Englishman in New York by Sting. That's his video, right? So, so. okay, guys. But, um, what about you, Keith? 
What are you rating it? Um, I'm going to give this a good, a good solid five, actually, because it's it's different. It ha- it runs at its own pace. It's ha- there's an intelligence to the whole proceedings, and it's I think it's a were you vested in the characters, you guys? As as yeah, as- I was. Mm-hmm. It's to me, it's a thinking man's horror film. That's what I quite like about it. And there's not, it's very rare. And, you know, it's our, you know, as Joe was saying, it's artfully done. And it's very rare that you do get a thinking man's horror film, really. And I, that's what I like it. And this is, and I, I would sit there and say that's probably why it didn't do so well when it first came out, because it is something, it's totally out of the spectrum of Hollywood. You know, if you look at what was coming out at that time, you know. It's not a right. Friday the 13th or a Halloween or Stock and Slash or Amityville. Yeah, horror. that was yeah, that was right in the thick of things, wasn't it? Yeah. So, you know, this is something a bit different, and that's what I like about it. It's just a different pace and and it stays with you as well. I mean, even after you after the yeah. final credits are rolling, it still stays with you for a long time afterwards. Well, that's that's what that's what I like about movies like that. That's why I'd give them a higher rate, because if it does stay with you and you wonder about it a little bit. Well, our next film is Liquid Sky, which is a 1982 American independent science fiction film directed by Slava Tachman and starring Anne Carlyle and Paul E. Shepard. It debuted at the Montreal Film Festival in August 1982 and was well received at several film festivals thereafter. It was produced with a budget of $500,000. It became the most successful independent film of 1983, grossing $1.7 million worldwide. The film was seen and heavily influenced a club scene that emerged in the early 2000s in Brooklyn, Berlin, Paris, and London called Electroclash. So what we're going to do is cut to the film trailer of Liquid Sky and be right back. would come and he would be a lawyer and I would have his children and on the weekends we would barbecue and all the other princes and their princesses would come and they would say delicious delicious oh how boring Teach me. Are you afraid? You're right. Because they're all dead. All my teachers. Liquid Sky. Hello, welcome back to the Relations Podcast, and we're discussing Liquid Sky from 1983. And Vix, what are your thoughts on Liquid Sky? Well, at first I thought I was going to be texting you and cussing you out. (laughs) because <laughs> I wasn't going to like it, but I actually loved it. I did. I mean, it was freaking weird. I will say that. Um, I mean, it takes a while for all of the threads to kind of come together on this because you're trying, because she's, what is she, a wasp? They called them back then. Yeah. From, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Protestant. And she wanted to. But Mayflower she, stock. <laughs> yeah. And she just wanted, she was a simple looking girl that wanted to be a model. And then she gets into this stuff and, and because she's very beautiful and she's different 
everybody wants to have sex with her. That was just the weirdest thing. <laughs> it's just like that poor girl, you know? And uh, I was watching uh, some of the YouTubers talk about it. And a lot of them kept bleeping out the stuff because if you're not into violent sex or, you know, I mean, if you're squeamish about things like that, this is probably not the film for you because there is sexual assault in it. And they don't really, I guess they spare you a little bit, but you know what's going on. But I mean, it's just really about this, this girl and how she's used so terribly, you know, and it, it's, it's, it's really artsy. I mean, when you want to talk about artsy, and this is like the atypical, probably underground film for back then. Uh, I think it inspired a lot of other film too. Well, what's, you definitely, quite, interesting, you go ahead. I mean, what's quite interesting about this film is, is that they, everyone that's in this film and was making this film all live in the same building and they're yeah. all artists. Um, they're all like, you know, and Carlisle, she was, you know, working with abstract oils at that time. She helped write this. Um, the, the director came from Russia. He wanted to get into filmmaking. He was making art films in Russia and he decided that, you know, the best place to do that would be New York. So him and his wife picked up and moved there and, you know, this and, is all in the you know, lower Greenwich area, too, the, the typical hot spots for all of that back in the day. All the clothes that they're wearing is what they, they these people wear normally. Yeah. I thought the flock of seagulls were there for a second. The hairdos, like, oh, I know you. <laughs> yeah. I thought well, this, this, movie, this movie felt like, you know, I, I went to the School of Visual Arts in, um, in New York in the early 2000s. And this feels like something that would have been made by a student at like the school of visual arts or, right. or, or an art film from like NYU or something. <laughs> um, I, I don't think anybody of... owns an eight millimeter camera anymore. Do they? <laughs> <laughs> Except for the schools that, that, that are training kids on them. <laughs> um, I think that, um, I think I saw a little bit of uh, a little bit of a, of an inspiration from like Federico Fellini and some of the ways some of the shots were composed. Um, this is definitely very art house. Like, like Vicky said, it's um, the way it opens up. Actually the, the, the opening sequence is actually very similar to the opening sequence of the hunger with the, uh, yes. the, 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 the music cutaways and everything. And also the music kind of sounded like, the music of like an eight bit video game uh, that, that would come out like that. at the time. Oh which, God, which it was, was kind of cool, but it, but it was fitting. It fit with it. I don't think if you put anything else with it, it wouldn't have made the same point. It was very raw. That's 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 the thing raw. about this movie. That it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't a very polished. It's not a very polished. It's film, not polished at all, and it kind of works in its favor because it's so strange. That I think the fact that it's it's it has so little polish actually works for it. It actually makes the movie more interesting. There's somebody in this film, and I cannot. I know him. I've seen him on other stu- other things. And I think this is one of his first films. That I can't remember his name, and I'm looking for it. I know you guys know who I'm talking about in here. Well, it's not because I, I found myself mo- uh, look, looking up most of the actors because I didn't recognize most of them from anything. I mean, Anne Carlyle, you you recognize because she's had a hell of an art career and she was right. in, you know, a couple of movies and, and some mainstream stuff. I think she was in Crocodile Dundee uh, briefly. Yeah, she was, I believe. And, and she um, still looks good. I saw her in an interview. I was looking her up on YouTube and stuff and she's, she's still around, I guess. Yeah. There's well, still, they're still very active in the art, in the art community in, uh, in New York. Yeah. yeah. Well, a couple of, a couple of them have died. I mean, Bob Brady, um, the guy that, the older guy, uh, he was talking to on the roof, who first right. they get killed. He is, he was their acting coach. He's an right. acting coach. He was an acting coach in New York. He also wanted to have sex with her. Everybody yeah. wanted to have sex with this girl. Well, I mean, to be honest, um, I saw this in Tulsa. I saw this in the cinema when it came out. This is mm-hmm. part of our, a bunch of ways to go to the art cinema there and it came out in and this is kind of like, yeah. I just like the UFO part, how they got the UFO into the UFO is what are they attracted to the highs of heroin? And then they see people the, having the, orgasms. You're, you're, when you have, yeah, when you're having an orgasm, your body. And um, it's serotonin or dopamine. Yeah. Or, yeah, dopamine. And that's, that's what they were attracted to. And the aliens were about the size of a pawn. How old about, was that a little bitty saucer or was that a Yeah, because yeah. because because the aliens are not that big. 
Right. They're like really I just small. I just knew that though every time you saw the little like round thing and the the light somebody was getting off and coming and going at the same time literally. So mm-hmm. and she boy I never heard the word, <laughs> I thought I used that word a lot but they threw the word cunt around in there more times <laughs> than I've heard in a long time for a movie. I'm going I wonder if the Brits are behind this <laughs> or the Australians cuz you all like the big C word. <laughs> I have to then say, though, that them going out to the clubs and the way they were acting with each other, it reminds me of the people I used to hang around with when I was in college at that time in 83. It's like, these are like the people I was hanging out with. These people in this movie are the people that I was hanging out with. And we were, and we were like, we're kind of like spelled like clubs and we just have to like, you know, be having sex and just be off our heads and, you know. Long well, live you, the 80s. <laughs> you change the hairstyles and the clothes and it's the kind of people I was hanging out with in the early 2000s, too. So mm. it hit home for me, too. Well, I mean, all yeah. the artsy kind of people that like film and art and everything, they're all different. And that's what makes them all so cool to be around, though, because everybody's very tolerant of each other. And there's there's camaraderie, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. What do you think for about Alex Harlow playing um, the male and female roles in this? That was one of the first, I think, other than what's his face? Oh, wait, they had an example of somebody else doing it. Oh, Adam Sandler. And I cannot place the movie. But they said that she, she did that very well, though. Considering that they don't have, it wasn't, they didn't have a lot of special effect budget. To work with, yeah. And, you know, they got them, and they got them in the scene together. And that was quite well done, actually. Where they're actually it was very well other. done. And when she's doing her little dance and her weird heel sort of thing in front of them and stuff like that. So it's like, he was her nemesis, but she was playing him. And uh, I mean, I, when they were all <laughs> when they were all trying to get her to have what have sex with him, I think was named Jimmy. And yeah. I mean, talk about pressure, you know, and then she what is she giving him a blow job? And then he just kind of psh, disappears. I like the way they made him disappear. Too. Yeah, yeah, so that was disappears. really well done. Yep. What was that? Oh. Uh, both, yeah. Oh no! Uh, I, I said he has, he has an orgasm and he disappears. So yeah. yeah, yeah. And I like the way they made him disappear. I thought that was really clever. Yeah, yeah the way the body just kind of like it like, looked like it turned that like just shriveled up. It, like, it looked like claymation or something, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, I don't know how you explain like, it. Like, I mean, um, one of the girls in the movie, um, the one with the long hair, um, the long blonde hair one. Um, she died because she was on the United 93 flight. She was a stewardess on that flight. Oh, was that her? Oh, yeah. I thought I recognized her face from somewhere. I know I didn't see her from acting before. I've never seen this movie before. How sad is that? Mm-hmm. So, but I mean, I think I, I mean, I like the, the idea behind Liquid Sky basically, you know. I quite like the whole idea that they, and I thought the set design was really well done as well, as far as the all the neon and stuff. And I mean, and you know that they really broke all that neon when she's going to be smashing it up at the end. You know how heroin seemed to be a, a thing in this movie, and I was—I don't know what you guys thought, but somebody was analyzing the film in another interview, like you know how I do my YouTube thing. But um, and you know when she's looking up into the Empire State Building. And she's like talking to whatever up there. Everybody's saying that was supposed to signify a heroin needle. What do y'all think about that? I can it's see possible. that. Uh, yeah. Heroin was a big I deal in this movie. I don't, movie. I don't know why. I guess that was the thing. I don't remember a lot. of. I mean, I none of us were really doing heroin back in that day. I mean, we were doing acid and pot and all that mm-hmm. other shit. But And cocaine was a big deal. Well, 1982, yeah, I certainly wasn't. Back in the yeah the eighties yeah everybody was doing that. No, shit. I wasn't really. In, I was never really into the whole heroin, and I never had no. fun doing the whole heroin thing. We were getting high, and we're doing acid and coke and things like right. that. Right. I was know, just trying probably. to figure out how this. How I mean, it, I don't think it was trying to berate the the artsy scene as what it was, but I guess was heroin. I guess I'm I'm ignorant here. That's where you guys always tell me stuff. Was heroin like a big significant thing in Greenwich back then and all that? Was everybody doing it? It might have been a big city art art thing anyway. I mean, you know, when you look at the Andy Warhol 
I mean, right. um, documentaries and stuff that like that. That was an excellent I mean, series, by the way. Well, I mean, you know, Joe D'Alessandro was doing heroin. Um, Holly Woodlawn was doing heroin. I mean, all those people were doing heroin, so it might be. You know, and this is like, the, this is the next generation, isn't it, of artists sort of thing, so... Oh yeah, we can't forget the the two characters. What is it? The um, oh god, the the scientist who wants to help the the aliens or whatever to help these two girls, and what's her name? The lady that owns the house is she Sylvia? Sylvia and Doctor Hoffman, jo- jo- Johan Hoffman, is that his name? Yeah, Johan Hoffman. <laughs> Dr. Hoffman, yeah, threw me for a second. But uh, I, I thought that they were kind of entertaining because I thought she was trying to get in his britches, I guess, and he just wasn't taking the point or whatever. She was she was just dogging on him through that, that scene. But she, he ended up dead, too, and I was trying to figure out why she killed him. Um, Because she thought that he... I mean, they didn't believe he was a scientist anyway. I mean, he wasn't very good at explaining what he wanted from them. He was kind of dorky. I know that. Well, I mean, the first, the first, I mean, first time he comes across the girls anyway, he's accosting her in the in the alcohol, and she thinks she's a cop. Yeah, sort of thing. Oh, that's right. Well, the little girl, she was she was a little shit, wasn't she? Her girlfriend. She was, wasn't she, wasn't she in Alice Sweet Alice? I can't remember. I know I've seen her face somewhere before, though. What was her name? Uh, Not Elaine. Oh, gosh. Paula E. Shepard. I'll look right now. What did you guys think of the acting in this film? I'm just asking. I don't think it was bad, actually. I mean, it was different. Uh, Yeah, Alice Sweet Alice is the only other movie that she was in. Oh, okay. That's where yeah. I've seen her. She she plays the murderer girl, the murderous girl in that, the one who murders Brooke Shields. Well, she's that was a good part for yeah, her. Yeah, she is Alice. Yeah, she is yeah. Alice. Yeah, and that's a good film, actually. Mm-hmm. A lot of these. Actually- is the, that's what I'm saying. The one thing I did see, I did. I always learn something new, which is why I always tell you guys I love it because I was I for totally forgotten or didn't know about all these midnight movies. I mean, there's like a complete catalog of them, really. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's oh, just yeah. never ending. Oh, it's yeah. Just... I mean, I... I'm just going to end up falling down a rabbit hole one night, like watching like a bunch of Jodorowsky movies and then a bunch right. of like movies even more, you know, more underground than that because there's, yeah. I, there's so much in that community, um, especially when you get to like the self, the, the, you know, the independently financed stuff and the self financed stuff. Um, well, the other early stuff, John Water films. Yeah, then you get to movies that never really played outside of art galleries. Like you'll right. like I remember seeing a lot of those in the early two thousands, where, where a friend of mine will invite me to an art gallery, and they're showing some weird movie from like the nineteen nineties that only shows at art galleries because it's the only they only license it to art galleries for whatever reason. So mm-hmm. it's a weird subculture at times, right? But it it could be it could be rewarding sometimes. Like you'll see some stuff that's like. Insane. Do they still exist? Because I know with Hollywood became their big, big box office blockbusters. And then you have holdouts like Lloyd Kaufman and, you know, trauma films. Like, like they're still very well known. But I mean, are these still going on to some extent or has it died know. out like the dinosaurs? You know, I don't know about underground filming at the moment uh, that's still going. But I mean, the films of that time, we can that. Kenneth Unger films are still around, still available. Andy Warhol, Paul, Paul Morrissey, you know, Sleep. Right. And that whole kit and caboodle there. All, I mean, I mean, they, I don't, I mean all, all, they're all available on DVD now and things like that. These midnight movie sort of things now. Right. I just wonder if people are still them. cranking out some underground stuff because, <laughs> you know, where do you find it? You know, if it I think is. It, I, I don't think I don't know if they are because at one point you could get them shown at midnight movies or shock around the clock or right you know and every place had its own little place where they would play these kind of films and you know you go I mean here we have the Scala you go and you know you, we have the Angelica theaters here in Dallas yeah but they tend to show like 
you know, 80s or, you know, drive-in movie sort of thing. But the art cinema, I just remember you, we would, I would go like the Scala, you know, one night and, you know, we obviously pink flamingos and then and then after that would be Andy Warhol's trash and after that would be Thundercrack. Thundercrack. So, well, these, you know. these kinds of movies now you'd have to like catch like the filmmaker showing it somewhere. Well like even eraser head was kind like, of weird. Like eraser yeah. head, would that be considered that wasn't underground, was it? That definitely. was really fine. Oh, definitely, yeah. It was an it underground was, so you time, consider yeah. that underground? Yeah, because it didn't have, it wasn't distributed by a, um, it wasn't distributed by a studio, by a, a studio at That's all. That's true. Okay, gotcha. I mean, it became distributed after the success of Elephant Man and things like that. Right. Then, you know, then it became, you know, available on. You know, that is Blu-ray such a weird movie. Film, so, so. I mean, I still wonder what I'm watching every time I turn it on or I see it on. It's like, okay, I'm going to try to figure out Eraserhead again. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, God. I mean, this made me want to grab the Blu-ray that Vinegar Syndrome put out, so I might, I might do that. Ah, uh, because uh, the uh, this is another movie. That, oh no, uh, Eraserhead's on Criterion. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Liquid Sky. Liquid this is a movie Sky. I, I didn't know Liquid about. Sky. Until I, bought, I bought a copy of it. It's a good. It's a good. It's the good Vinegar Blu-ray. Syndrome uh, Blu-ray. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. really, th- I'm really thinking of grabbing it now because, like, I, I had no idea what this movie was, and I it looks like one for the collection. Oh. Yeah. Well, it has a good has good documentaries about the making of it and talking to the people now. And they couldn't find Paula Shepard. They don't know what happened to her. But um, but she's. I wonder about- if she died or you don't. I'm like, she's got to be out there somewhere. An IMDb pro or something. Well, I mean, I guess the- I guess if you're looking for underground films, I think the only underground films that are probably really being made are probably horror films, really. And you can and you know and. They tend to be picked up by Shutter. Yeah. Or they end up on Tubi a lot of times. Yeah. Well, she's still I alive. Think Shutter, I think even for Shutter, I think you have to uh, you have to hit a certain a certain level of, of of quality and polish to even get on that. So I'm, I'm thinking this is more something like you, you'd find on like Tubi or like one of the really low level uh, uh, low uh, low level um, indie uh, labels. Right. I couldn't find I mean, I found it on YouTube. I had a hard time finding it. What? Look at Sky. Yeah, well, I mean, somewhere where I mean, you know, to, to watch it without it all being all blurbed and, you know, looking bad. I mean, it didn't have, I didn't buy the DVD. She married a husband yeah. and had a daughter and ha- adopting a nurturing career outside of acting. I guess she just became a mom. I mean, what's quite interesting about this film is on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 96% approval rating. I think it's because not, not many people have seen it. I think that's one of those situations where, like, the mainstream critics didn't get a chance to savage it because they didn't know it existed. Boy, they do savage well, re- the shit out of stuff, too. I mean, it's just like, give people a break. They made something, you know? I mean, a lot of these people that criticize it, what have you made? Well, I have to say that the critics, um, I remember the critic when it was in the Tulsa paper when this, when it was released and it got a fantastic review. It got, got, the film got a lot of great reviews. It's kind of, kind of weird thinking about it, really. Do you I, think I, it's I, an expressionist film? I think it's an expressionist film. I also think that the reason, probably the reason why it does, it got quite good reviews is that it's, something different that's never been done before has never been done since it does have a very good look to it i mean like you know the aliens views and the color schemes and oh this was shot on 35 millimeter not super eight okay my yeah. bad so i think that's probably the reason why it's you know it did get good reviews and stuff like that because you know, for the budget that they had, they did, they did a very good job with it. And well, it was really a, well, I mean, for 500 grand and wanted to get 1.3 million at the box office, that's not bad for an independent small film like that. Yeah, it was the most successful independent film in 1983. Yeah, that's what they said. I so, mean, it's really interesting take to see how some of these people explain their, their analytical. I mean, it, it, I just, I like hearing other people's take on stuff and it's really kind of, entertaining well the idea basically came out is that the director's wife um she wanted to write a script about a woman who could not have orgasms 
And that's and why then, she didn't die. Everybody goes, well, why didn't she die? It's like, well, nobody knew what the hell they were doing, apparently, when they just jump on top of her. So yeah. they would get off. She didn't, so she's still alive. And the, the, the director and his wife are friends with the acting coach who actually cast the film. And all these people were in the acting class. That's how they all go. And then um, they met Anne Carlisle, and um, she asked if she could go because her English wasn't that great. And that's how the film got together. So, quite interesting, really. It is. I mean, it, it is basically Mickey, you know, Mickey and Judy. That's kind of, you know, show on in the barn, really, isn't it? I mean, the, the flat that they're living in was Anne Carlisle's flat. That's, that's how it was she was living. Right. So, and um, they and the, not, none of the film is ad libbed or improvised whatsoever. No, they did it all. I mean, I I think I think you got to give people like this a really big round of applause for doing what they did with minimal for back then, and it still has the staying power today. I mean, I've never seen it before. Like I said, I was like, I saw the beginning, and the beginning is like really, you know, how it starts out. It's kind of weird, or I think it's like, ah, oh, geez, what do they got me watching? <laughs> And then about 20 minutes into it, it's like, oh, this is really good. You know, mm. so, I, it's, I, I started looking up more movies like it because I liked it so much. But I mean, uh, it was just it was just kind of weird how she was just abused. I mean, I, I mean, she 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 was a nice person. I, I didn't understand why people wanted to exploit her so much. I didn't understand well, she, that. She, She's an addict, isn't she? I mean, well, what kind of addict? Yeah. I didn't see her do any drugs. Did you? Well, she, uh, she so, brings the guy. Okay. Well, she brings the okay. guy home because she wants she wants to do coke with him, doesn't she? Okay, I mean, she, you're right. Okay, I mean, she and she does. I mean, she has shot up before because she says I don't feel like doing that tonight. So obviously, she does. You know, she's part of that as well. Um, she hangs out with a bunch of junkies, sort of thing, and yeah, true. You know, and I mean, she brings that. I mean, the reason why she gets attacked in the first thing is because he. She brings it back to his house because she thinks he has coke. Of course, all he has is all he has is um, downer. So he starts pumping, you know, force feeding and those into him. He had the most ugliest underwear in the world, anyway. Oh but, my um, god! I think it's just, <laughs> but, these guys. I mean, it's, it's, it was just. I mean, if, if you're not into, you know, sexual assault, this is definitely not your movie. If you're in, not into exploitation, this is definitely not your movie. Well, you know, the thing is, people can't say much about it because this is written by two women. Yeah, that's the funny part. A lot of these scripts and movies, they are written by women. It's just like, they know what people like, I guess. So I guess we'll get on to the scoring. So Joe, what are you going to rate Liquid Sky? Um, again, it's going to be four, four and a half because it, it's it's done with very little. They did they managed to do a lot without really anything. Um, and it kind of, and maybe I'm a little nostalgic for for the days when I was first making movies when I was like 21, 22 years old and I didn't really need money to make them. It would just be me and everybody that I knew in film school. We'd all help each other out on each other's films. And maybe that's what I kind of saw here. Was, I bet uh, you was, do miss that. That just sounds so cool. I, I do sometimes. Cause being able to just do something without having to pay everybody when, when you're all 20, you know, 20 21 years old. Yeah. It's just something we're going to do and we're going to make, and we're going to make movies. It's it's more fun. Whereas as you get older now, you got to start uh, concerning yourself with uh, with budget and time and insurance. all this stuff. And, yeah, insurance and uh, this this kind of made me nostalgic for those days where I was just kind of like hanging out in New York and like hanging out in that community, and we'd all just get together and make a movie. And what about yourself, Vix? What are you going to write it? Well, I guess as much as I love the movie, some of the music just kind of was like graded on me a little bit i'd say 4.5 just because some of the music was but i mean i loved the acting and i loved the artsy part of it and it was kind of an expressionist film and i've never seen too many of them i don't think 
So it kind of gave me a little different perspective. And like I told you, I started looking, you know, because when I first watched it, I go, I got to go in and find an interview or something. Tell me, explain to me what the fuck I just watched so I can understand it better. It's not that I didn't understand it. I mean, I would probably have to watch it again to catch everything because you don't always catch stuff in a film like this the first time around. But the aliens I found fascinating, you know, and and we didn't really talk about the end, how she fades to black. I mean, she doesn't. I, I mean, why did they kill her at the end? I think that she. Well, she's bag. I. I'm not sure they killed her. Or they oh did. wait, I, she I, took I, a bunch of drugs. That's right, and she yeah. was absorbed because that that whatever they were oh, looking no. for that toxifying component that comes from sex or drugs. But uh, she, I, mean, I just she's begging, she's begging them to take her anyway. So, and so she starts she doing all this. And plus, Sylvia was going to try to k- get after her for killing the, the good doctor there that she was trying to bang. But mm. I mean, it's a fascinating film. Definitely 4.5, five points for sure. I mean, it's just a different kind of it's it comes from a, a time and, and, and a culture and a subculture, which is really worth <laughs> remembering. Yeah. I'm going to give it, and, you and know, I'm going to give it kind of, four. It was what, yeah. hon? I was going to say the music being jarring actually made it interesting to me. It was, it was just, I was trying to, I can't remember what they said they did with it. I don't know if they used pipes or, or flutes Wind or whatever. chimes and flutes and drum machines. And- yeah. Just like, just stop hitting the high decibels. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but sorry to cut you off, Keith. You were talking about your rating for. Oh uh, yeah, no problem. I mean, I'm going to give it a four because I think the, uh, I think it's an artistic film and stuff like this. You have to be in the right mood for it. That, yes. I, I, I would rate, I rate it higher. If it, I don't mind the soundtrack, but sometimes the soundtrack gets a bit, goes, kind of goes right through your brain sometimes. Eat it, edibles, then watch it. Yeah. But, <laughs> Everything's you know, but better it does, on edibles. <laughs> I mean, I think the first time I saw this, I was taking acid and a bunch of us went to go see it. Uh, See, so this is probably the first it time opens your so mind. Well. It opens your mind. So, but I, I mean, I do like the film, and I do like what it's trying to do, and it, and I like, you know, the, I like the aesthetics of it. I like the makeup design. I, I love like the makeup. The I love the makeup. And it reminds and it reminds me of hanging out with my friends. When, it just reminds me of the eighties, and I miss the eighties, as we all know. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cut to a new podcast who's going to be advertising this. So take it away. I'm Austin Lugo. I'm Andrew Harp. This is With Nothing to Say. And let's talk about movies. With over 3,000 films log, Andrew and I, best friends since middle school, have dedicated our lives to watching, making, and talking about movies. Each week, Andrew and I handpick a movie he's seen, I've seen, or neither of us have seen, and dive deep into anything and everything to wannabe cinephils could ever think of. From horror to dramedy, we do it all. So join us as we talk about everything movies, and maybe you too can become a bona fide cinephile. Hello, welcome back to Literature Legends Podcast. Well, it's time to end our show. Next month, our 80s feature will feature The Lady in White and One Dark Night. Um, then, of course, you know, Dark Shadows will be next week, and after that, um, our book to screen will be Ringu, the book by the Japanese writer and the Japanese film. And our make remake will be Pulse, the Japanese version and the American version. So it's good night for myself. Good night, Joe. Good night, everyone. I'm really looking forward to The Lady in White. I love that movie. I love that movie, too. (laughs) And good night, Vicky. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. And we'll see you in her 80s next time with Lady in White and the Daily Film, One Dark Night. And we'll see you next time.